Welcome back to Screen Crush, I'm Ryan Airy, and this is all of the Easter eggs, references, and little things that you might have missed in the first trailer for Black Panther Wakanda Forever. I am queen of the most powerful nation in the world! There is so much to explain in this trailer. How the filmmakers are going to handle the tragic death of Chadwick Boseman. Who is the new Black Panther? Who are the blue skin people? Who are these soldiers attacking Wakandans? And who is this new winged footed badass flooding the most advanced nation on Earth? So let's break it down, baby. I am ready. Let's do this. The trailer is set to the song No Woman No Cry by Bob Marley and the Wailers. It's a perfect choice for a few reasons. One, the ruling body of Wakanda is now all women. Shuri, Ramonda, Okoye, Ayo, and Nakia are all the main characters of the movie, and they're all all mourning T'Challa. In this case, after the passing of the king, Wakanda is in a state of turmoil. The royal family doesn't have the luxury of mourning because there are outsiders who want to take advantage of T'Challa's passing to weaken Wakanda. Bob Marley, like Chadwick Boseman, also died young at the age of 36. So that cultural memory is entrenched in this trailer. The song is ultimately optimistic, saying that even though bad things have happened to us, the future is always bright. So we start off with Nakia looking out into the sea. Personally, I love this character, and I kind of hope that she's the one who becomes Black Panther at the end of the movie. You get to decide what kind of king you are going to be. Nakia is looking out to the sea, foreshadowing the arrival of Namor, but also notice that there is what appears to be a Mayan temple in the background, placing this scene on the shores of Mexico. Now, the actor who plays Namor, Tino Chorta, is Mexican, and we see the Atlanteans wearing what looks like modified Mayan headdresses. Now, we're going to talk about Namor and the Atlanteans in just a bit, but first, I gotta say, this is a pretty on-point redesign. The first Black Panther movie has strong themes about colonialism and exploitation of Africa by the West. You think your ancestors got these? You think they paid a fair price? Or did they take it like they took everything else? Don't scare me like that, colonizer. And then Mayan culture was erased by a right bastard named Cortez. So Wakanda and Atlantis are both these indigenous cultures who survived being purged by European colonizers. I have a theory about how that theme will factor into the movie's story that I'll go over in just a bit. Hey person, your face hair looks real nice. Did you go to the groomer? No, Doug, I am my own groomer. Sometimes it's hard for human guys like me to keep our bodies nice and groomed, but Manscaped makes that easy. They're the sponsor of this video. What is a Manscaped? Manscaped.com is a global leader in men's grooming tools and hygiene solutions. They just sent me a bunch of stuff in their Platinum Package 4.0. Now, by far, my favorite thing in this package are these trimmers. This is the Lawn Mower Body Trimmer with ceramic blades and a skin safe guard that keeps you from cutting your most personal areas. Mm -hmm. This trimmer is waterproof. It has an LED light, so you can see in the shadowy nether areas where you might be trimming. It also has a charge meter, so I know just how much juice is left. Plus, it has a travel lock. You tap three times to make sure it doesn't accidentally turn on in a suitcase. And this package also came with two products to help with body odor protection. We have the Crop Preserver Deodorant and the Crop Reviver Ball Toner Spray. It's very refreshing. And I'm loving every minute. And we have the Weed Whacker Nose Hair and Ear Hair Trimmer using the same skin safe tech so you don't tug on your nose hairs. For a limited time, you get all of this plus two free gifts. We have the Shed Travel Bag and these Manscaped Anti-Chafing Boxer Briefs. And when you opt into their Peak Hygiene Plan, you can get all of your favorite Manscaped product replenishments sent straight to your door hassle-free. Just click the link in the description to get 20% off plus free international shipping plus these two free gifts when you enter the promo code ScreenCrush at checkout. Next we see Queen Ramonda and Okoye walking into Shuri's lab. After the passing of T'Challa, I think their primary concern is going to be the recreation of the heart-shaped herb. Remember, the panther goddess Bast first led the Wakandans to the herb, and then the Wakandans cultivated the herb for thousands of years till Killmonger came along. So when it comes time for another king, we will be ready. Burn it all! So now, maybe Shuri is trying to synthesize the heart-shaped herb or find traces of it around the world so they can create a new Black Panther to protect Wakanda. So a little explanation on that. The Black Panther is the avatar of the panther goddess Bast on Earth. Avatars like in Moon Knight? Yeah, kind of like that. And traditionally, the king is usually the Black Panther, but not always. In Civil War, King T'Chaka had already passed the mantle of Black Panther to his son, T'Challa, before he died. The Black Panther has been the protector of Wakanda for generations. Mantle passed from warrior to warrior. Now, the obvious choice to become queen is Shuri. Long story short, she was queen of Wakanda for a while in the comics. In T'Challa's absence, her actions actually led to war with Atlantis, which I'm going to go over in just a bit. Next, we see Ramonda on the throne, probably as a steward more than a queen. Remember, Wakandans choose their successors through trial by combat. Is this your king? Huh? 
As for how T'Challa dies in the film, my guess is that it will just be from cancer. That would be much more tasteful than having him say die in battle off screen and then using that conflict to like feed the story of the movie or something like that. It would also obviously hit hard for all of us knowing how bravely Chadwick Boseman fought this disease in secret for years. Then we see these people in white doing a ceremonial dance. Now I think this would be the funeral for T'Challa set more as a celebration of his life, but Shuri is in mourning. It's really tough to watch since this character was always so lighthearted. The real question is what are those? Now, this symbol on top kind of looks like the sigil of the Republic in Star Wars, featuring eight spikes united at the center. But I'm going to go out on a limb and say this symbol represents Wakandan unity, bringing together the five tribes, the Will of Bass, the Golden City, and Necropolis, joined together by the Great Mound of Vibranium. This might also be a burial place that represents the crossroads of the afterlife. In the comics, the kings are all buried in a place called Necropolis, the City of the Dead. It was also the headquarters of the Illuminati for a while. And get this, it's also where Eric Killmonger's followers brought him back from the dead in the comics. Just bury me in the ocean with my ancestors that jumped from the ships because they knew death was better than bondage. Now, I 100% think we will see Eric Killmonger return in this movie because he was briefly King of Wakanda, at least in spirit form. But more on that in a bit. Good friends we are and good friends we love. Next, we see Shuri's lab at sunset with the Golden City in the background. Again, putting the pressure on her to become the new queen or to refine a replacement for the heart-shaped herb. Now, this next shot is very interesting. It's the Dora Milaje all taking up different positions in front of relief sculptures. Now, I have two thoughts on what this room could be. First of all, in the comics, the Dora Milaje are a little bit different. They're women from all the tribes of Wakanda who are meant to be potential wives for the king. Now, the king would never choose any of them because it would mean that he was favoring one tribe over another. Point is, they represent the tribes of Wakanda in a special way that is tied to royal court. This could be the same here, with these women occupying sculptures unique to their tribe. If that's the case, then this could be some sort of trial the Dora Milaje are holding for one of their own. A little later in the trailer, we see the great Michaela Cole wearing blue Dora armor, facing off against her sisters. She is playing the character Anika. Now, in the comics, Anika trains the Dora Milaje how to fight. She killed the chieftain of a village who was abusing the women there, and so she was sentenced to death by Queen Ramonda. But she's also in love with Ao, who rescues her from death, and they steal this blue midnight angel armor. Now, during this time, there was a lot of unrest in Wakanda following two wars, Thanos' invasion, Namor's attack, etc. So, the two of them went around liberating women from these warlords and formed their own kind of rebelling nation against the throne. So, I think we'll see a similar power vacuum in this movie, with T'Challa's death causing many people to seize power and stirring up unrest among the people. So, that's one theory for this room. But then, if you translate the Wakandan text, you get a different story. It reads, In power, T'Challa, our hero, in honor, forever and the bottom columns spell out Golden City and Kingsguard. So this could be a kind of tomb for T'Challa, or they simply altered the council chamber in honor of the fallen king. This tree is the same one that we saw in the Wakandan afterlife. Next, we go to another woman looking into the sea, Queen Ramonda. I was always under the impression that Wakanda was a landlocked country beside Lake Victoria, but maybe now since they're being attacked by a race that lives in the ocean, they've altered that. She looks into the sea, which brings us to the birth of Namor. So here's a little background on Namor from the comics, because this will tell us exactly what we can expect to see from him in the MCU. Lord Namor of Atlantis is the prince of the sea. Now, it's tempting to say that Namor, the Submariner, is like Marvel's Aquaman, but it's actually the other way around. Namor first appeared two years before Aquaman in Marvel Comics number one. That's right, he and the original Human Torch were the very first Marvel characters. Android Human Torch, please explain. Oh, I'll get to that. So Namor, like Aquaman, is half human, half Atlantean. His father was captaining a ship called the Lemurian Star, which is actually an Easter egg in Captain America, the Winter Soldier, right here. Target is a mobile satellite launch platform, the Lemurian Star. Then he met Namor's mom and, you know. And along came baby Namor. He is the rare Atlantean who can exist outside of the sea for long periods of time. He's super strong, can obviously swim really well, and has these little wings on his feet that allow him to fly. And most of the other Atlanteans are blue skinned, so Namor never quite fit in with them or the surface world. This imbalance between the sea and the land makes him just a little bit crazy. Like physically, it drives him insane. Sometimes he's very, very good, and other times he becomes very, very bad. He's also traditionally much more of a prick than Aquaman. Namor always carries a royal air about him, like he He's better than everyone else. Now, in Aquaman's early comics, he was very happy-go-lucky. My ability to talk with fishes of no help, Wonder Woman. Writer Peter David reinvented him to have long hair, a beard, and well, really just act more like Namor, giving him a chip on his shoulder. And Jason Momoa's Aquaman is more of a bro. Everybody smile. So there's lots of room here to draw distinctions between these two characters. And get this, Namor is also a mutant.
So, Namor first appeared in Marvel Comics way back in the 30s and 40s. In his first appearance, he fought the original Human Torch, who was an android, and we've actually seen this version of the Torch in the MCU here at the World's Fair. Now, this is very exciting and could lead to some flashbacks of Namor that include some other World War II era heroes. So, during World War II, Namor was on a team called the Invaders, and they went around Europe fighting Nazis. The Invaders were also hinted to exist here. Invaders create Avengers. Now, that team included the original Human Torch, the Android, and Captain America and Bucky. But we already saw the adventures of Captain America in World War II and found them lacking. But that's just it. All of Cap's World War II adventures were shown to us in a montage, so it is possible that there was a functional Human Torch android fighting in Europe, and also Namor in Europe, and that Steve Rogers briefly joined up with them on some mission to take down a Hydra base. I love the idea that we could be seeing hidden chapters of the MCU as we explore Namor's past. So after World War II, Namor disappeared from the comics for a while before Stanley and Jack Kirby found a brilliant way to bring him back in the Fantastic Four. Johnny Storm, the new Human Torch, finds a really strong homeless guy with amnesia, and he's like, hey, that guy looks familiar, and then he burns the hair off his face to reveal Namor. The Fantastic Four help Namor get his memory back, and by the way, I gotta mention, Namor really wants to bone Reed Richards' wife, Sue Storm. He's like Arnie Ziff, constantly asking her to leave him and to go with him to Atlantis to become his queen. So, Namor goes back to Atlantis, sees that it's destroyed, blames humans, and then attacks New York with a tidal wave, until his crush Sue talks him out of it. And this is pretty much how Namor's career works. He gets really, really mad, he acts out, and then he becomes a hero for a while, even joining the Avengers and the Defenders for long stretches. Next, we go to another woman looking into the sea, Queen Ramonda. I was always under the impression that Wakanda was a landlocked country beside Lake Victoria, but maybe now since they're being attacked by a race that lives in the ocean, they've altered that. She looks into the sea, which brings us to the birth of Namor. Now notice his mother is human, but his father has blue skin. Just like in the comics, Namor is a hybrid born of two worlds. Later in the trailer, we see Atlanteans with breathing apparatuses on their faces so they can be above water, but Namor does not need one because he is a child of two worlds. This is similar to Aquaman, but I love the changes they've made. Atlantis here is less of a technological marvel and more of a tribal hidden city. Now this version of Atlantis could also be a technological empire, but they have their own distinct culture, making it more of an underwater version of Wakanda. Wakanda is built on the concept of Afrofuturism, what could the African people have built without colonial interference? And now the Atlanteans are asking the same question about the Mayans. We see the Atlanteans riding whales as we lead into what might be the cause of this war. People in diving suits. They might be explorers looking for Atlanteans, or more likely they're searching for a deposit of vibranium. See, but notice this is not a Wakandan ship. My guess is that the other countries in the world don't like that Wakanda is now the most advanced nation on Earth. So they're looking for their own vibranium meteor to challenge Wakandan supremacy. Now, if there is a vibranium deposit in Atlantis, this may be what have allowed the people to breathe underwater. And so maybe they have their own version of the heart-shaped herb. I got a theory on how that'll figure into the plot that I'm gonna go over at the end of the video. Next, we see white soldier seizing Wakandan lab, showing that the West is staging a proxy war against this nation. This happens many times in the comics, with no other country ever conquering Wakanda except for Atlantis. Next, we see Ramonda in the throne room that has been flooded by Namor, like in the comics. These fires stretching upwards are reminiscent of Killmonger's destruction of the heart-shaped herb in Black Panther 1. In both cases, we're watching one of the country's most honored institutions be destroyed. Next, we see Shuri meeting Riri Williams, who's getting her own Disney Plus show, Ironheart. In the comics, Riri Williams was a brilliant student at MIT, who, long story short, ended up cobbling together her own Iron Man suit and being mentored by a hologram of Tony Stark, who was dead at the time. The origin has obviously been tweaked for the movies and show. Riri is now in Wakanda, maybe as part of a guest scholarship program or something like that. You will spearhead the science and information exchange. <laughs> You're kidding. And she'll be present when all this trouble goes down and she'll make a suit so she can help out. So this is going to be her origin story. The two of them greeting each other evokes this moment when T'Challa entered her lab in Black Panther. Really get you in the feels, guys. Next, we see a flashback of a home being burned and Namor watching the flames with some underwater dwellers. So I'm going to guess that this is the human home where Namor grew up decades ago, judging by this wagon out front. This is in keeping with his origin in the comics, where he was old enough to fight in World War II with Captain America. I'm guessing that the locals didn't like that there was a mutant baby with winged feet growing up here. So they burned his home, trying to get to him and his human mother. Afterwards, he went to live with the Atlanteans, kind of like the reverse of Eric Killmonger's origin, who was denied the chance to live among his own people. Next, we see a mirror shot of Namor coming out of the sea onto the shores of Wakanda. It shows that he was driven to the sea by violence, and now he has returned to the surface world to revisit that violence on the people who killed his mother. Again, mirroring Eric Killmonger. 
Next, we see Wakandans flying to the borderlands as M'Baku looks upward. My guess says that this is the Wakandans asking for aid against Namor, or that Nam maybe Namor's stolen some Wakandan ships. It might even be that this is them coming to deliver the news of T'Challa's passing to the Jabari tribes. And later, we do see him on the shores fighting Namor as the Wakandan ships rain down fire on the Atlanteans. Notice the Atlanteans run for cover, but Namor stands his ground because he is invulnerable. And then, oh, Angela Bassett brings it. And my entire family is gone! Well, we are. Have I not given everything? Interestingly, she says that both her children are gone. Is Shuri kidnapped by the Western mercenaries we see in the trailer who are storming a Wakandan lab? She might be telling this to Namor or maybe even yelling at Everett Ross since he represents the world's governments to Wakanda. Like I said before, the nations of the world are likely taking advantage of T'Challa's passing to get Wakandan tech and Ramonda is showing that she is not backing down. Later, we do see her in the UN probably delivering a similar message. This memory of Chadwick Boseman is placed at his funeral judging by the people in white playing drums and the text reads, the Panther King lives forever in us. Next, we get a clear look at the Atlanteans wearing Mayan-inspired garb while standing on an overpass on the surface. And later, we see Okoyo getting ready to fight them in the same location. And check out Namor's giant throne made of the jaws of some ancient prehistoric fish. Badass. Badass. It is badass. Shows this Atlantean culture has been around for centuries. And next, we are back to Riri Williams making her own Iron Man armor, hammering out what is probably vibranium with a vibranium hammer. Now, if Shuri has been kidnapped or is missing at this point, then they would need Riri's technical expertise to help Wakanda. This is also meant to evoke Tony Stark creating his armor in a cave with a box of scraps. She breaks out a heart logo. Hey, like her name, Ironheart. That's right. Then we see a brief shot of Namor on the surface touching a mural of a sea serpent. Now notice it has blue scales. This is probably how Westerners interpreted his people, the Atlanteans. And he's shocked at how species the surface dwellers are and how much they misunderstood his kind and demonized them. Then there's a few interesting flashes of shots. There's a Wakandan ship attacking police cars and a Koyo in the door of Malaja fighting troops in Wakanda. Like we're seeing Wakandans face off against threats from Atlantis, but also from the human governments. Here we see the Atlanteans getting ready to travel by whale and this badass shot of the door leaping at them as they climb their walls. So like I said, it wouldn't surprise me if the governments of the world staged this war between Wakanda and Atlantis. Like maybe they discovered the Atlanteans, discovered their vibranium, so they told Namor some lies about Wakanda killing some of their people. And then after these two nations fight it out, the governments can seize whatever vibranium is left to become the new world power. And finally, we get this sting. And when I wake up... Now notice the lyrics here, when I wake up. This could be referring to when the nations of Wakanda and Atlantis wake up and realize they're being manipulated. Or when the Black Panther mantle wakes up from its rest. Or given that the armor is gold-tinged, like Killmonger's, maybe he is resurrected and becomes a new Black Panther. This would be an incredible decision. Eric Killmonger is the best villain in the MCU and the most relatable. Having him become the Black Panther, like he briefly was in the comics, would give us a former villain who is trying to reform his ways and lead a nation. So I think it's likely that the Atlanteans have some version of the heart-shaped herb in their possession and that they give it to the Wakandans. Then these two tribal nations will unite against the real threat that's pulling the strings. What threat is that? Well, I think the secret villain of this movie is going to be a major villain from the comics. It's your mom. Well, that's all the Easter eggs that we noticed, but if you found any, let us know in the comments below or you can at me on Twitter and if it's your first time here be sure to subscribe and smash that bell for alerts. For Screen Crush, I'm Ryan Airy.